So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do under my links on Instagram on at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start with some words from The Active Life by Parker J. Palmer. And it's in reference to our obsession with being professionals. Jean Sue's critique of the active life in his poem is simple. Too much of our action is really reaction. Such doing does not flow from free and independent hearts, he says, but depends on external provocation. It does not come from our sense of who we are or what we want to do, but from our anxious reading of how others define us and what the world demands. When we react this way, we do not act humanly. We become cogs in a machine whose every move is forced by what is happening elsewhere in the interlocked system of cogs. All such people are prisoners in the world of objects. This is not a happy picture, but there is truth in it. Too many of us consent, or are forced, to spend time doing things for which we have no heartfelt reason. If we were asked, why are you doing this? We would not know how to answer. Somehow a situation emerged in which this had to be done, and somehow we ended up doing it. We do it to hold a job, to make a living, to satisfy the expectations of others, to fill our time, to evade the fact that we don't know what else to do. But not because the doing comes from inside us, When our action is dictated by factors external to our souls, we do not live active lives, but reactive lives. History, daily experience, and the nightly news offer endless examples from the political to the personal. Of the inexorable logic of reaction, one nation angers another nation, The harsh rhetoric of ideology is aimed across borders, and soon weapons are aimed and fired as well. Rich topsoil is depleted by constant plowing and planting because short-term economics demand it, despite the irreplaceable long-term losses. One driver angers another on the street, hard words are exchanged, a gun is drawn from the glove compartment, and someone is murdered. A welfare clerk curtly dismisses a woman in desperate circumstances because her case falls just outside the guidelines. Ironically, in cases such as these, the actors often claim that they acted to exercise or protect their freedom, even as the knee-jerk nature of their responses proves they have lost the freedom to act. If they were acting rather than reacting, they would transcend the tight, deterministic logic of their situations. They would escape the reflex response and claim the freedom of authentic action. But Xian Su goes beyond the claim that our action is too often reaction. His deeper criticism is that many of us intentionally seek out those situations that will trigger our favored reactions. The strong man looks for weights to lift. The the brave woman looks for an emergency in which she can show bravery. And we might add the nation or person with weapons looks for a chance to use them. 
The corporation that owns farmland looks for a chance to exploit it. The clerk with rules in hand looks for someone to exclude. Sean Sue is describing the, act, the actor as addict, both dependent on situations that trigger a certain response. However noble strength and, ba and bravery may be, it is ignoble to seek excuses to flaunt them. When we do so, we reveal that strength and bravery are not our true nature, but merely public postures. The people in Sean Su's poem have no self-sustaining identity. They are wholly defined by the settings and relationships of the world of action. They equate selfhood with particular activities, and their vitality depends on being in places where they can play these roles. Put them in places where their competencies are not required, and they find themselves on the thin edge of non-being. Though this role of kind of role playing is widespread among us, I think Sean Su is especially concerned with a class of people that we would call professionals. Experts, philosophers, critics, politicians, lawyers, liturgists, business executives, and the like. If it was important in his time to diagnose the pathologies of professionalism, it is even more important in ours. Not only do we have more professionals who may do themselves damage, but any pathologies they may have multiplied many times over in a society that has become so dependent on their skills. As professionals, we like to define ourselves in ways that stress competence, high standards, an ethic of service, personal sacrifice, and so on. But in the poem Active Life, Xu is explaining the shadow side of professional activity, and he would probably propose a different definition. A professional is a person who has invested long hours and much money to develop an allegedly rare ability that others can be convinced to need and to purchase at a high price. Admittedly partial, such a definition points to the ways that we professionals get caught in the world of objects that Sean Su describes in the spinning of those interlocked illusions that too often trap the professional and the society in a vicious cycle of nonsense. Becoming a professional it requires an investment of time and money that can easily set the vicious cycle in motion. We have a myth in our society that the more education one has, the more choices one can make. True, more education may lead to more affluence and hence to more consumer choices. But more education may also narrow the range of meaningful choices about the directions of our lives. Once you've spent 10 years and a small fortune getting a medical degree, how can you choose to be a logger if you discover that logging is what you really want to do? If we had perfect discernment before we began professional training and we got trained in our heart's desires, all would be well. But we lack such prescience. It often takes years for our hearts to speak. And when we do, we often cannot hear them, having been deafened by the system that Sean Sue describes. From the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Self-dramatization and resistance. Creating soap opera in our lives is a symptom of resistance. Why put, years, put in years of work designing a new software interface when you can get just as much attention by bringing home a boyfriend with a prison record? Sometimes entire families participate unconsciously in a culture of self-dramatization. The kids fuel the tanks, the grown-ups arm the phasers, the whole starship lurches from one spine-tinkling episode to another, and the crew knows how to keep it going. If the level of drama drops below a certain threshold, someone jumps in to amp it up. Dad gets drunk, mom gets sick, 
Janie shows up for church with an Oakland Raiders tattoo. It's more fun than a movie, and it works. Nobody gets a damn thing done. Sometimes I think of resistance as a sort of evil twin to Santa Claus, who makes his rounds house to house, making sure that everything's taken care of. When he comes to a house that's hooked on self-dramatization, his ruddy cheeks glow and his, he giddy-ups away behind his eight tiny reindeer. He knows there'll be no work done at that house. Resistance in the choice of a mate. Sometimes, if we're not conscious of our own resistance, we'll pick as a mate someone who has or is successfully overcoming resistance. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's easier to endow our partner with the power that we are in fact, that we in fact possess but are afraid to act upon. Maybe it's less threatening to believe that our beloved spouse is worthy to live out his or her unlived life while we are not. Or maybe we're hoping to use our mate as a model. Maybe we believe, or we wish we could, that some of our spouse's power will rub off on us if we just hang around it long enough. This is how resistance disfigures love. The stew it creates is rich, it's colorful. Tennessee Williams would work it up into a trilogy. But is it love? If we're support the supporting partner, shouldn't we face our own failure to pursue our, pursue our unlived life rather than hitchhike on our spouse's coattails? And if we're the supported spouse or partner, shouldn't we step out from the glow of our loved one's adoration and instead encourage them to let their own light shine? Resistance and this book. When I began this book, resistance almost beat me. This is the form it took. It told me, the voice in my head, that I was a writer of fiction, not nonfiction, and that I shouldn't be exposing these concepts of resistance, literally and overtly. Rather, I should incorporate them metaphorically into a novel. That's a pretty damn subtle and convincing argument. The rationalization resistance presented me was that I should write, say, a war piece in which the principles of resistance were expressed as the fear of a, a warrior feels. Resistance also told me I shouldn't seek to instruct or put myself forward as a purveyor of wisdom, that this was vain, egotistical, possibly even corrupt, and that it would work harm to me in the end. That scared me. It made a lot of sense. What finally convinced me to go ahead was simply that I was so unhappy not going ahead. I was developing symptoms. And as soon as I sat down and began, I was okay. Where Does the Temple Begin? Where Does It End? by Mary Oliver. There are things you can't reach, but you can reach out to them all day long. The wind, the bird flying away, the idea of God, and it can keep you as busy as anything else and happier. The snake slides away. The fish jumps like a little lily out of the water and back in. The goldfinches sing from the unreachable top of the tree. I look. Morning to night, I am never done with looking. Looking, I mean not just standing around but standing around as though with your arms open and thinking maybe something will come, some shining coil of wind or a few leaves from any old tree. They are all in this too. And now I will tell you the truth. Everything in the world comes, at least closer and cordially. 
like the nibbling, tinsel-eyed fish, the unlooping snake, like goldfinches, little dolls of gold fluttering around the corner of the sky, of God, the blue air.